Today, what we'll do is we go out on the lake and we'll deploy one of the nets. So it's a bottom set gill net and hopefully we'll catch a fair number of whitefish and lake trout. Stop here, I see bottom. Hey, start here? Yep, start right here. And I'll set the net. See, it's setting itself. Like silk. we can really get a, an idea on what's going on in, in this lake. We're getting a grip on the current state of affairs in terms of the fish, and we have something now then to compare oh, <laughs> later in, in time. It may never change and it may stay as it is now. We have to be able to assess it periodically. It's good, not bad. A lot of lake trout and a few white fish. Okay. My role is basically to merge TK, traditional knowledge, with Western fishery science. This is a, a good sized fish for eating, but probably on the lower end in size range. So for testing for total metals, we want to cover a, a broader spectrum in size. So say from this, you know, four pounds up to 20 pounds. In other words, what historically and typically people may come across as anglers or netters and eat. To help you, <laughs> you don't have nails, it's hard to do. <sighs> All right, gather around, guys. I'll set up a table where everyone can gather around and I'll go over the, the, I guess, the unique anatomy of each fish species. And then also to show them what I process so, each fish for. We have here an interesting assemblage of fish that says a lot about the species composition of Lac La Marche. Mm. Now we'll look at why these are relatively easy to separate once you know a few tricks and what to look for. So the lake whitefish, this, this is average size for an adult. And let's have a look at its mouth. The mouth is very small compared to the others. And what do you think it eats? Having a small mouth. This guy goes along the bottom, or just above the bottom, eating little invertebrates. So he'll pick snails off the rocks, and he'll pick up little food items, zooplankton-type creatures in the water column. They sometimes feed on insects near the surface or at the surface. Distinguishing characteristics, very large scales. Look how big the scales are on this whitefish compared to the lake trout even the pike. The lake whitefish lives usually in relatively deep water over a rocky bottom. The pike, this is a very different fish. The pike is almost the opposite. Shallow water, weedy bays. Lake whitefish swim along feeding. The pike on the other hand is a solitary ambush predator. What does that mean? So this guy is hiding in the weeds, not moving at all and then small fish are coming by, he has an incredible capacity for acceleration. So he could go from being completely motionless and invisible because he's so camouflaged in the weeds to lunging out and grabbing a fish. It's so fast that the human eye can't even follow it. It's incredible. 
And once he catches the fish, what does he do? Well, let's look inside the mouth of a pike. Not only does he have huge, sharp, I mean, these are big dog-like teeth, but way sharper. And this isn't even a big pike. Imagine a pike this big. It just gives you an idea of what these top predators can get to in size. And try to imagine the prey, what kind of fish fit into a mouth this big. And then the rows of teeth here to keep the prey in the mouth and it can only go one way down. So I can easily rub this way, but notice I can't pull my hand out. So imagine if the jaw is clamped shut. Anything in there is doomed. Very efficient creature to blend into its environment. Next, the lake trout. Lake trout are interesting because they're also a predator like the, the pike, but very different in terms of where they live and how they feed. Lake trout are typically deep water fish. They're also camouflaged to some degree, but they're not ambush predators. They swim in open water and they swim quite well, at, at relatively fast. So they are able to catch the small food fish that they feed on. They can be quite big. I've seen them up to 50 pounds, so over 20 kilos. The lake trout is very adaptable. So at times he'll be able to eat insects. They eat fish, they could eat uh, snails on the bottom. Whitefish have small, small eggs. Lake trout have fewer, but very big eggs in comparison. They spawn over rock bottom. So do these, but lake trout, not only do they spawn in the shoals in the lakes over wave action, rocky exposed areas, but some populations can move into rivers and spawn in the rapids or below waterfalls. First thing, we're gonna look at size. Size, you'll see, is very important for various reasons. When we're doing the length of the fish, there are two measurements we take. One is called fork length. Easy to remember, the fork of the tail, at the closest point to the body in the fork, we lay down the tape and to the tip of the nose. So this one is 543 millimeter. You got it? Yeah. Okay. The total length, we go to the tip of the tail here, and then we do the same thing, 591 millimeter or 59.1 centimeters. Now, for some studies, you may be required to do the girth. For that, you take the deepest, fattest part of the fish and you wrap it around until the two meet. When they look at what's called condition factor, so what condition the fish is in, where you look at also the, the length to girth proportions, can tell you a lot about the fish in terms of for that size, are they too thin or are they, are they really fatty and in good shape? Next, we do the weight. Hook the fish onto the scale and then it says 1.93 kilograms, so 1,930 grams. Now the interesting part is we're going to look inside the lake whitefish and see what makes him what he is, I guess. Look at the things we see here, guys. I can gather around. Who knows what this is? Okay, there's two lobes. So there's one here. And then on the other side, see, this one is quite developed. Lake whitefish being fall spawners, here we have a, an adult male ready to reproduce shortly. Now remember, whitefish don't spawn every year. They spawn every two to three years. A way to confirm that is you send the information to experts who deal just with reproductive biology. And experts can tell you, yes, you are right. What you wrote down and your opinion about it being a spawner for this fall is correct. How do they know? The ratio of gonad weight to body weight it doesn't lie, it's math. At a certain point, it'll reach a weight that is pretty much the maximum for a fish that size. 56 grams. 
Now, I can tell you from experience that that's pretty close to that maximum. And this guy is for sure going to be spawning in around a month. That's the liver situated way up in the gut, in the anterior portion of the gut cavity near the head. On all fish that you'll be seeing, it ranges from dark coffee to blood red or almost black red. Okay, next, the esophagus and stomach. Note that there are parasites on the external and inner lining of the stomach that's very normal. These wormy-like things, they're not parasites, they're called pyloric CK, and it helps for digestion in the fish. Another thing you need to know here, this, too bad this is actually not inflated, but the swim bladder is normally like an air sac in here. And they can control when they go down and up. Fish don't have to fight to swim up or swim hard to go down. They just regulate the amount of gas in their swim bladder. And it's like a blimp. It can go down and up with no effort whatsoever, like a balloon. And then along the spine is the kidney. So they have a kidney that goes all along the spine. Let's see what it was eating. You can learn a lot about what fish are eating. And in this case, it's all little insects and snails and, and freshwater, like shrimp, all tiny little invertebrates. In other words, small organisms. Big white fish often switch to eating small fish. Here's a snail, look at this. An actual snail. You can even hear it. That's my goal, to show them what I process each fish for. So how I take an aging structure, for example, from the head of a whitefish. Very important. Remember how we did length and weight? Well, I hate to say this, but that's almost meaningless unless we know how old the fish is. Because you have to make the connection, the correlation of age and size. Otherwise, the fish can be pretty fat, pretty big, but if it's really old, wow, that could be a problem because it means it grows slowly. On the other hand, imagine if it's a big fat fish and it's really young, then you can say, wow, conditions in the lake are really good. It's a very productive system and the fish are growing fast. So you see, age is so important. Now, believe it or not, we can tell the exact exact age of this fish. And for that, we have to go into the head and find two little bones, ear bones called otoliths. For this, what I do is I put the knife like this, right where the gills come together in a V and join the head. See, the gills, here's the V, and you go a little bit behind that joining point. You have to be careful. Look at that. Inside these capsules of jelly are bones. There's one, look at this. The secret to everything lies in here. Then you take that piece, lay it flat, and it's just like when a tree is cut down and you see the rings and you can count them to see how old the tree is. Exact same thing with that. Every summer and winter is told as a story in that. It's pretty much ready to go. You can even throw it on the fire like this, skin side down. We need to take a sample for testing of potential contaminants. So what do we do? We take a small cut here, and the, the piece, they say, has to have no bones or skin on it. So, we take the piece, and in the bag it goes. In the end, you see, we're able to get a lot of information out of the fish, and we're, we're still able to give it to the boss, and she can do whatever she needs to with it. She's like, what am I gonna do with you? <laughs> so imagine a scientist in Toronto who never visited Tlicho territory 
can look at this under the microscope and say, ah, the summer of 1997 was nice and warm and long. And he would be right. The traditional knowledge, of course, is often a starting point. So we can use that to get a general idea of what's going on in terms of the fish in a lake. And then combine that with fishery science, we can really get a, an idea on what's going on in, in this lake. Whitefish, I've seen in most areas, 10 to 15 years old is typical, but I've seen them up to 27 years old. Yeah. In the 30s even, in the high 30s, we had a few. I've seen some up to 50 years old. But sometimes the really old lake trout can be small. It depends what habitat they live in, what they eat. So it's not always the big ones that are the oldest. <laughs> it's a big fish.